Um, welcome to, to everybody. Um, I'm Bertrand La Chapelle. Some of you know me, some, some don't. I'm the director of the Internet and Jurisdiction Project. Uh, and Paul Fellinger here uh, is the manager of the project with me. This is not an Internet and Jurisdiction Project workshop. It's a pre-event that we thought might be interesting and, and useful for uh, the different actors. Uh, the general idea is the following. In the process for developing the agenda for the IGF, there are many, many proposals for workshops on very different topics. And on each topic, there are many ways to address the different issues, which results in a large number of workshops, sometimes overlapping, sometimes overlapping, not to mention the fact that it is difficult for people to jump from one workshop, and in many cases, you're prevented from attending one that you were really interested in because it conflicts with another one. So we thought that in the list of workshops that were retained as the agenda of the IGF in Bali, completely from our own initiative, we picked a certain number of, of them. You, you, get a, you get a mic, Paul, if you want. And we decided to produce uh, a small track guide that you have on your, on your table. Uh, it's completely unilateral. It's our selection. Um, we identified, I think, about 30 or so workshops. Over 35. 35 workshops that are dealing with, with issues that are interconnected. It can be related to freedom of expression, copyright issues. It can be related also to um, privacy, of course, but to procedural issues like what is the, uh, the whole track around multi-stakeholder principles or enhanced cooperation and so on. So we decided to do this, this track guide that you can use during the week to identify some of the workshops you may be interested in. And second, to just plan the flag and invite the people who organize those workshops to just get together to discuss a little bit what they plan and explain to various people what they plan to do during the, uh, during the week. And the angle we wanted to, to, to put that under is a concept that we would like to, to sort of field test with you, uh, which is this notion of digital coexistence, or coexistence of different norms in digital spaces. Because we felt that a certain number of those topics dealt either with those tensions in copyright, in privacy, in freedom of expression in many respects, but also that some workshops were dealing with how to address this, the multi-stakeholder model or the approach, the, uh, the procedures and the, the type of mechanisms allowing people to discuss. So in a certain way, I, I regret that uh, after eight years, uh, we haven't managed to uh, establish a format for workshop rooms for IGF meetings that would be square tables rather than classrooms because fundamentally it's much better for interaction. But in spite of this, of this format, the goal is, is a completely open discussion and my suggestion is the following. To, to just go around the room in a first, in a first round asking the people who are actually organizers or participants in a particular workshop, one of those that have been uh, identified in the list, to basically give a rapid input on two, two elements. The first one is, what is fundamentally your workshop about? So it's an elevator pitch about why it's important, why you, why you care about this topic, and why you wanted to make this, this workshop, because on a personal basis, I believe that the reason why we're here is because we believe strongly in everything that we're pursuing. And people would take the time and pain to organize workshops, to make the proposal, and to manage the logistics of it. That means that they care about the topic. So this is the moment where you can just explain why you care about the topic that you've picked and why you think it's important. The second thing is related to this expression, again, of digital coexistence, which is just a, a moniker and a, and a general term 
And I'd be ver we would be very interested, Bo and I, in seeing whether it resonates with your uh, issues, whether it is something that is indeed a problem that you encounter or that it is a formulation that represents some of the things that you think is desirable or should be achieved. So, Paul, do you want to make any additional comments? <laughs> no, um, I think um, the time is precious. We just have two hours, so um, and we have a lot of people present here who organize very interesting workshops. So um, maybe the easiest way is um, for those people who would like to present um, their workshops in an elevator pitch um, um, of, I don't know, 60 seconds or 1.30, um, <laughs> come in front because like that they see all the different faces which <laughs> people in the back don't do. So I, I invite you um, and someone needs to be the first one to, to just come and, and stand up and explain basically um, what you're doing in order for others to understand um, when the workshop is going to take place and, and what it is about. So who's going to jump first? Oh wow. Well. No, no, no. Ah. We get a, a <laughs> candidate. <laughs> It's completely unrelated to... Thank you. Aisha Hassan from the International Chamber of Commerce and the BASIS Initiative. We are doing a workshop on day three from 11 to 12.30, co-organized with the government of Brazil, the Association for Progressive Communications, and the Internet Society. It's on developing and effectively using multi-stakeholder principles. Uh, the goal of this workshop is to build on uh, several sessions, one that took place at the UNESCO-hosted WISIS Plus 10 review event in February, um, and also the main sessions that will have taken place this time on principles for multi-stakeholder cooperation. Um, this multi-stakeholder interactive session is going to try to look at some of the, the principles that are floating around about what does it really mean to set up a multi-stakeholder process or forum uh, at the national or regional or, or international level. And when we're talking about a multi-stakeholder approach in these processes or forums, um, what do we really mean? There are a lot of words that float around and so uh, the pitch for this, this uh, workshop is we'd like to de-jargonize the words. What do we mean when we say e equal participation? What do we mean when we say inclusiveness? Um, so the goal of this session is going to, be able, going to be to do that, but to do it from various perspectives and sets of experiences um, to make sure that we're all understanding going forward where we can uh, shape some common principles, uh, but that they would be understood by the various stakeholder perspectives. Thank you. Please come. <laughs> okay, number two. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Neil Kipri. I'm from University of North Carolina at Greensboro. And tomorrow morning, uh, from 9 to 10.30, we have a session on privacy in Asia. And I'm co-organizing that panel with my colleague, Jim Foster, who is from KU University. Unfortunately, he couldn't join. But we have, we have very interesting uh, speakers, one from Indonesia, one from Japan, one from China, and one from Singapore. And what we are talking in that uh, panel, basically, is privacy is a very, very new concept in Asia, but it is uh, institutionalizing or diffusing very rapidly. And some of them are, OK, many, many economies have some frameworks from the European Union. Uh, framework and some of the things come from the U.S. and how exactly they are integrating and incorporating those many principles. And also there is the EPIC thing and they want to harmonize these, all these privacy regulations in the many of the Asian countries and who are the key actors in the privacy debate and the government, for example, is very important in China and the private sector is very important in uh, India and also how these uh, privacy frameworks are affecting the use of these big data, cloud computing and all those things. That's what we'll be talking tomorrow morning and uh, please join if possible at 9 a.m. tomorrow morning. Uh, you can find the room numbers. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you very much. One, one question as, sure. as, as I hear you, you speak. Uh, there's always a distinction between when the frameworks have not been developed yet okay. and now people are identifying what kind of frameworks they can take inspiration from. Right. But there's another dimension which uh, I wonder whether you will address it is 
whether there are deep cultural perceptions regarding the very word of privacy. I mean, to use Aisha's de-jargonizing, in many cases we use the same words and we don't mean the same things behind. It doesn't evoke the same, the same thing in different regions. Is that something you're going to discuss as well? I think so. There are a lot of these panelists from Asia, and I think there, there might be the meaning of privacy in Asia may not be exactly the same as they use in the Western countries. Probably. So the panelists will tell you tomorrow morning. Thank you. <laughs> okay, who's next? Oh, Helen. so excited that I had to be next. Um, I'm Ellen Blackler from the Walt Disney Company. We've organized a panel um, with UNESCO, is that what? <laughs> uh, with UNESCO and ISOC and the uh, Bandung Institute of Technology here in Indonesia on how to encourage an environment that grows uh, local content production. We'll be looking at kind of all the factors that encourage content creation from uh, as a driver of, of adoption of the Internet. And so we'll be looking at all of these issues that contribute to an environment that allows people to create content, including freedom of expression, pop, uh, privacy, <coughs> copyright protection, and a lot of the uh, issues about infrastructure investment. So come, one, 11 o'clock one. tomorrow. We're so exciting. We're listed in the brochure twice. <laughs> okay. No, thank you for the... <laughs> You know, this is very bad because you're one spotting a, a mistake that we did, and second, <laughs> you I didn't mean to. Yeah, that was. And, and, and second, you have the goal of organizing a workshop at the same time as ours tomorrow at oh. 11 in room. <laughs> but so, that's okay. Yeah. Well, maybe that's why. It's <laughs> no. One one question. Uh, one question. I was uh, talking at uh, yesterday evening uh, with with Yanis. Uh, there's one thing that is interesting: is the distinction between the production of local content and the availability of infrastructures like cloud and the tension between having local clouds or general clouds accessible locally to produce local content. Is that something you're going to discuss? So our panel is more on the, from the, the content creation from the, con the creator's perspective. It's actually part of a family of panels that is going to look at the infrastructure issues, including the availability of IXPs and caching and local hosting. And I, I'm sure there they will talk about the difference between kind of a regulatory requirement to have a uh, and a more engineering driven requirement about what's efficient economically and engineering wise. So, but that panel uh, is panel 53. I don't know. I think it's Wednesday in the afternoon. Uh, where they'll be. It's, it's another one in on, the morning. on Wednesday. Okay. okay. And so, and uh, they're kind of an integrated uh, okay. pair. You next, and then you. Hi, I'm Andy Smith from the British Computer Society. Um, we're doing a talk tomorrow morning, nine o'clock. Uh, it's great they've managed to organise things so that we all conflict with each other. <laughs> um, we've got a great one. They, the organisers were so good they managed to get one of our panelists on two panels at the same time. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, happens. <laughs> <laughs> so we're doing a talk, um, it's based on um, identity assurance, but it's, it's that wonderful topic of uh, security, privacy, anonymity. Um, we found over, the, we've, this is our third time at um, the uh, UNIGF, um, and over the last couple of years we found that the balance isn't really between privacy and security. Privacy and security actually overlap and, and support each other really well. The balance is between security and privacy and anonymity. And the, the, the kind of the fun part is uh, how anonymity balances uh, against the security aspects. Um, and when you start looking at uh, identity online, it's how do you get that balance between the use of identity um, to fund the internet, the use of identity attributes as currency, um, to pay for things on the internet um, so that you can mm -hmm. be targeted with spam, um, and how you balance that against the sort of privacy and anonymity aspect. So we've had some really good, uh, robust debates in the past, and mm -hmm. we're hoping we're going to have the same tomorrow morning. So please come and join what us. What time? Nine o'clock.
nine o'clock uh, in room five. Okay. Next door. Two, two questions. Uh, one, uh, when people talk about anonymity, they also deal indirectly with pseudonymity, i.e. the fact that you can use a pseudonym, but still your real name somehow is available somewhere else to be revealed in case there is a need to reveal, for instance. Are you dealing with that? Uh, yes, we are. Um, I mean, it's, you can use CCTV as a, a good example of, of pseudo-anonymity. Um, if you take somewhere like London, you've got 6,000 odd CCTV cameras and you have 20 people looking at them. Mm. Um, they don't look at every single camera. What they do is they look at the cameras that uh, where there's an incident or where there's mm -hmm. a problem. They then look at the footage from that. They don't look at everything. Um, so what you have is even though you're picked up on all these CCTV cameras, you are still pseudo-anonymous. Mm -hmm. um, and it's the same online, you use identity. Um, and for the most part, you remain anonymous or you can remain uh, anonymous until such time something goes wrong or someone wants to, to trace you and then certainly in the UK you need a, a legal support <coughs> but you can then get the IP addresses, find out when someone was logged on, where mm. they were logged on and you can trace them through. Trace but them for, for instance, the, the, the reason why I raise this is because this is an issue, uh, for instance, in China on Weibo, in China you're supposed to give your real name but on Weibo you can use a pseudonym or be in a category where you're a verified user, where your old credentials are being, are being displayed. Uh, likewise, for uh, DNS operators, you can use proxy registration, but you're still supposed to give your real name to the proxy. I say suppose, but... Uh, so this notion of two layers uh, of identity is, is something that I just wanted to, to highlight. The second thing is, you said that there had been workshops uh, in the previous years, how do you see the evolution of the discussion from the previous years uh, and what is your anticipation for what you want to achieve this year that will mark uh, a step forward? Is, the, is there a concrete um, formalization of something or do you see a step or, or something you want to accomplish this year? Um, well, when we first started doing this, the debate was you know, the, the balance between security and privacy. Um, what we found over the last couple of years is it's not, it's actually security via anonymity. And it's the, the use of anonymity and the perception that people only want to be anonymous so they can do bad things that is, um, it is kind of a, a keystone for the debate. Um, what we've also found is that both privacy and, anonym and anonymity are very contextual and it really depends on what context you're in as to whether anonymity is a good thing or a bad thing. Um, so we've, we've already made quite a lot of progress and there, there are some yearbooks that we've done over the last couple of years which you can download from um, the BCS website and there's links off of the IGF website. This year, we're really trying to um, see how much can be done and, and whether there is the possibility of resolution of the debate and the balance between anonymity and, uh, and security. Okay. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is um, Verena Weber, and I'm from the OECD. And together with our stakeholders from the technical community, from civil society and business, we are organizing workshop number 209, uh, which is on um, an open internet platform for economic growth and innovation. Now, some important information. There, have been, there has been a change in schedule. So the workshop is not taking place as indicated in that leaflet, um, but it's actually taking place on day two from 9 to 10.30, in room three, which is in Nusa, Do Nusa Dusa Hall, so which is like in the main building. The workshop number is 209. 209. 
So if you want to come, it will be on day two uh, from 9 to 10.30. And so basically, um, um, we saw that from its very beginning, um, the internet has always been um, an extraordinary open platform. So open in the sense that any individual can access it, organization, um, civil society groups, um, but also open in an economic sense. So um, that means that um, it got very easy for companies to create a small business, to create applications, and that's actually why it worked so well. Um, so we have three um, objectives in this workshop. Um, one is um, to um, define the several dimensions of an open internet. Is it still working? Yeah. So um, what does it mean from a technical perspective, um, from a social perspective? Um, then the second objective is to make the link between um, the openness and social and economic benefits. And um, the third objective is um, the question of how we can ensure that on an international level, um, the internet remains an open platform. And I mean, we've seen um, some incidents during the last month which could actually question that model. So um, we'll have um, a pretty interesting set of speakers. So from a government perspective, we have um, Egypt and the US. Um, then we have the technical community um, that will um, present like um, what's openness from a technical perspective when it comes to open standards, et cetera. Uh, and we will have someone from um, civil society and business. So I think it's gonna be a very interesting one. So please come, not on day three, but on day two. <laughs> Thank you. One, one, one question I want to, to, to bring in. Um, in terms of facilitator of innovation, the fact that there is a low barrier to entry for people who are launching new activities because they can use services that are hosted or their cloud or whatever that are in another country and is a computing power as you go, for instance. That has been a tremendous boon, especially in regions where there is no infrastructure exactly. of that sort. In the current environment, there is a trend towards renationalizing. I don't want to say fragmentation, but renationalizing. Is that uh, an articulation that you're going to address in the uh, in the workshop, i.e., the, the cost of moving towards uh, re? localization, data sovereignty, or things like that, that would reduce the availability of transborder mm -hmm. platforms? Yeah, that would be definitely an issue, because mm -hmm. what we see at the moment is, I mean, I'm from Germany, and the advertisement there at the moment is the cloud made in Germany. Mm -hmm. And if you think of cloud computing, I mean, the main benefits of cloud computing um, come from the fact that it can be sold as a commodity, that the data centers are spread all over the world. So that goes against the concept. And we see that like in various regions of the world, actually. So there, there are now countries that oblige you to really store the data in your country. So yeah, that will be one question that will be addressed. Okay. J just as, a, as an indication, um, in the workshop that we organized for the Internet and Jurisdiction Project in, in Delhi, uh, without naming names, it was very interesting to see that the, uh, the message from the uh, business community, the Indian business community, to the Indian government locally was be careful when you push for data sovereignty because you harm the potential for the Indian industry to become a major player in the cloud services. So it was very interesting to see the dialogue. I mean, we were stepping back and watching them talk, uh, but it, it was a very strong message. So, okay, thank you. Who's, Who's next? next? <laughs> yep. Oh, Yanis. Oh, no. Ladies first. Yes. <laughs> Yanis next. And if people in the audience, <laughs> the audience, <coughs> uh, in the room, <laughs> have questions to 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 presenters, uh, do chime in. Uh, I cannot stop talking, but yeah, yeah. Well, uh, the number of my workshop, our workshop, is uh, number three oh eight. It's on Thursday at nine o'clock, and it's about privacy and innovation. Um, I'm from the Danish Media Council and also representing the European InSafe Network. And we are organizing this workshop uh, with the IT University of Copenhagen. And now speaking of the word you asked about the meaning of the word privacy, this workshop is a, a kind of rebranding uh, project in the sense that privacy, online privacy in 
the last couple of years or in some years now has had has gained a somewhat bad uh, reputation where it's been juxtaposed to everything that is social open uh, innovation in uh, cloud services uh, big data and so on and so forth so what we're going to do is to try to have a discussion about how we might rebrand privacy um, seeing it as maybe a new basis for a new market uh, model um, it might be a little bit difficult, but we're going to try. We're going to have uh, around 10 panelists uh, from the industry. We're going to have uh, panelists from, gov from governmental panelists, and we're going to have also five young people who hopefully has a little bit of an innovative perspective on what privacy means. So that's Thursday at uh, 9 o'clock, and I hope some of you will come. Can you elaborate just a little bit on the notion of rebranding of privacy, i.e. To, to turn it into a market in itself, or what do you mean? Yeah, um, we're actually building this on the thought, that, that well, actually on recent trends, and, and um, lately if you look at uh, user demands, we're increasingly asking to trust the services we use, uh, increasingly uh, uh, young people, for example, are asking about control, controlling the context of their interactions online, and if you look at, uh, there's a lot of, uh, lately, particularly this year, there's been a uh, rising popula popularity of services that, for example, uh, sh promise that they can give confidentiality of information to their users or something like Snapchat where you have uh, multimedia messages that disappear. I'm not saying that these services, per definition, are privacy protective, but they're feeding into a need um, that is clearly coming here and that can be a basis for innovation. So there's a chance that there might be a new business model. One, one additional question that goes to, to what Aisha was mentioning earlier. Um, in terms of the meaning of words, um, and this goes also to the question I was asking on the other workshops on privacy for Asia and so on. I speak completely personally here, but when I want to talk about the data that people are posting voluntarily in public on social media platforms, I have trouble calling that privacy. It's a management of my intimacy rather than my privacy. I feel that the word is more adapted to very private data that can be my health data, that can be my credit card information. Is that kind of terminology discussion uh, one element in, in the discussion? I don't mean that what I have in mind is, is, uh, is the appropriate wording, but the fact that the word privacy is covering a lot of different types of data is, I feel, a bit troubling when we try to really be operational. Should I respond? Yeah, <laughs> because I, I, I disagree. <laughs> I do think it, like, according to me, I, I see privacy as, as more of a deeply humanly rooted need to, to set your own interaction, your social interactions, for example. And I think we can move on by looking at privacy as something that can actually exist in an open social space. So perhaps I'm defining it more as a, or maybe not me, but in general, more as a, and I think if you ask young people also, it's more of a, a, an identity management process. Um, and so I do it's understand. The anonymity thing that was discussed before as well. Yes, and it's probably also based on the recent revelations that we actually do not have any privacy online. So I mean, we need to to look at privacy in an innovative way to meet uh, uh, the different stakeholders to find an agreement on this is and something we can invest in. Okay. We, we can we can come to that because in the course of the presentation, I see threads that are going between different workshops so we can we can elaborate. Thank you. Yanis, you were next. Yeah, thank you. Um, so in the context of this debate, I will present two events that UNESCO is organizing. Uh, that is the workshop uh, number 98, 290, and 297. This is a joint uh, combined um, a workshop on protection of journalists, bloggers, and media actors in digital age. The justification or, or the reason for that, uh, UNESCO uh, is um, uh, working in implementing UN action plan on safety of journalists. And in that context, uh, the uh, conversation 
about the uh, challenges uh, spe specifically that are uh, uh, coming up in the when it comes to digital media, so we'll be uh, at the heart of this discussion. And then on this me uh, workshop will take place on 24th of October at 9 o'clock in the morning. The next day at 9, we will be uh, presenting the new concept that UNESCO is working on, uh, trying to uh, encompass in two words uh, the meaning of uh, the internet. Uh, in other words, uh, we will be presenting co a concept of uh, internet universality, uh, which, uh, uh, according to our appreciation, uh, should be based at least on four fundamental principles. That is, uh, should be based on rights, should be open, should be accessible for all, and should be multi-stakeholder driven. So if you want to know more, please come uh, on, on 25th at 9. Um, we'll be talking a little bit about an, an animal and just giving a preview uh, that uh, all four, uh, uh, all four uh, sort of features that I mentioned uh, represents different parts of the uh, elephant. <laughs> and uh, by touching them, you always think as blindfolded, you always think that uh, this is something different or something else, but in reality, that is these are four features of the same thing, and um, of course, that is uh, based a little bit on on the UNESCO vision, and and the and the fact uh, that uh, we see that uh, international debate is shifting from infrastructure development to actual use of internet and. Uh, so in that context, uh, talking about uh, internet as we want to see it uh, as, a, as a universal is uh, also very topical in our, uh, in our mind. So we will be presenting that. Of course, we will uh, try to collect, uh, we will try to collect as uh, many uh, opinions and feedback as, as we can uh, to see if we need to fine tune a further concept uh, so that we can present to member states uh, at one point. I suppose that the, uh, the term universality is also intended to, to mean a sort of objective of uh, universal access in, in, in general term, right? In, indeed. <laughs> We're trying to capture everything one can think of. <laughs> so name the elephant, basically. <laughs> okay, so the, the timings are? It's uh, thurs Thursday, 9 o'clock, and uh, Friday, uh, 9 o'clock in room 5. Okay. So Owen has a, has a Any question? questions? No. Um, Who's next? Question? Yeah, question? No? Okay. Yeah. Question? Uh, my name is Sanegitu. I'm Sanegitu Ekpe from Nigeria. My question goes to my young man here. Yeah. says everything. Do we really need privacy on the Internet? Uh, pretty speaking. Okay, let, if that question, unless you want to give a direct answer, yes or no, <laughs> we can we can keep it and have a discussion on privacy afterwards. I, I, I think I think the answer is in one word is yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Any other? Okay. Who's next? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, my name is Ramiro Álvarez Huarte. I'm from Asociación por los Derechos Civiles, an NGO in Argentina. And we are organizing and I'm moderating um, panel 102, 105, 110, Digital Rights Protection in Europe and Latin America on day three. It's going to be at 9 a.m. Um, it's one of, of those uh, workshops that were put together by the organizers that where they saw opportunities of, of collaboration. And so what we're trying to achieve in this, in this workshop is to precisely try to build bridges between Europe and Latin America, to try to understand the ways cooperation may happen between both continents. We're going, there are going to be experts uh, from both Latin America and Europe discussing different issues, but especially uh, questions regarding privacy, data protection, and freedom of, ex of expression, 
online. Our goal is, is to <coughs> try to see uh, how we can work together in the future. I think the idea is to create a fruitful dialogue around these issues. So you're basically kick-starting um, the debate um, along those issues between the two regions. Until now, there exists no formal platform to discuss and address those issues. Yes, that's actually what we saw when we began to work on what we wanted to achieve. And we believe there are like, important ways in which both regions can work. We've seen reactions, for instance, to the Snowden leaks from both uh, continents. Uh, presidents in Latin America have expressed concern. Uh, Dilma Rousseff uh, gave a speech at the United Nations. And so we believe this is probably a good time to explore the ways two regions, these two regions can work, and that are two regions that are probably not uh, immediately involved in the scandal. Great, thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, Jan? If I can stay here, it's going to make it easier. Of uh, course. For me. I think the, the idea that you have uh, floated here is very interesting, this question of digital coexistence. I think that uh, um, over the years we have seen this uh, evolve and, uh, and the coexistence is there. there. There is an overlap, a constant overlap. There's, there's transversality everywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, there is uh, transversality across the years in time. There is across the topics. There is uh, across the, the stakeholders. There is a mix of everything. When we are talking about these things, we are talking about security, we are talking about law enforcement, about privacy, about human rights and freedom of expression. We are talking about public service. We are talking about journalism, that is about democracy. We are talking about business, innovation, mm -hmm. creativity, mm -hmm. making money, and so on. We are talking about whistleblowers. We are talking about Snowden all the time. We are talking about entertainment and culture. We are talking about different groups of people doing different things on the internet and looking for different things and, uh, and trying to realize different objectives and so on. If I take two of the many things I said, security and law enforcement, mm -hmm. you see the transversality there. They are not the same thing, and yet there mm -hmm. are issues of coexistence, there are issues of tension between them, there are issues of different legal frameworks and different actors and different mm -hmm. interests private and public and, uh, and uh, national and transnational and, and so on and so forth. We have in the Council of Europe a cybercrime convention that if you apply it to uh, individuals who engage in criminal activity online, it applies in one particular way. If you explore how would it apply to, uh, to, to uh, uh, abuse uh, of uh, online capabilities, mm -hmm in a national security context, it would apply differently. But yet the notions are the same. Mm -hmm. There is this tension. There is this digital coexistence in that context. I think that it is, it is very interesting. And, uh, and uh, now turning to your concrete question, yeah. uh, the Council of Europe, which is the, the, the collection of 47 countries in Europe, uh, made a number of proposals, and uh, I would just focus uh, at this point on one, on uh, big data that will take place on day two at 11. Mm. Uh, it's workshop number 203. Big data there, you see precisely what I have been talking about. It is the combination of things. It's business opportunities, it's uh, privacy threat, it's uh, um, a number of things that come together. It is co-organized together with the OECD. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and uh, the idea is to see what the, the, the tensions are, what the different interests are, what the balance should be between different interests in order to, uh, to, to make the best of it. So there you are. I think it's a great uh, idea, the, the question of, of uh, digital coexistence, and we should continue to explore that in the future.